Hey, thanks for joining us today. Here in our channel, you can catch all of our messages and live services. And our hope is that you would experience the presence of God in a very real and tangible way. That's right. And if you want to make sure that you never miss a message again, all you need to do is hit the subscribe button below this video. Thank you, Rachel. You're welcome. So we are in a series on the kingdom of God called The Kingdom of God. And it is um, awesome. I'm glad it's come at this particular time. It's been very helpful in our life because Diane and I have been on a uh, kind of a crash course on what it's like to live with almost no margin left in your life over the last six weeks. And it's good to be reminded of God's providence. It's good to be reminded that God is great, that God is in control. And if you lean into him and trust him with everything you have, that he will line your steps up for you. Um, good news, over the last couple of weeks, Diane and I have seen God move amazingly on our behalf and just line things up and just lock things together for us. And um, so it's been awesome. And so I want to share a little bit about that with you today, a little bit about our journey, a little bit about some uh, wisdom we've gleaned over the years. And, you know, just asking you guys again to, to keep the, the, the big picture in mind in that if Jesus is alive, then he is what? Lord of the world. And if Jesus is Lord of the world, then he is also the Lord of? There you go. We're all good at that. Can we do it? This is the way for old time's sake? No, just kidding. <laughs> But this is really, you know, not so much in terms of what kingdom is about and the theological implications of the kingdom, which is a great study, and if you haven't studied it, you should. But really, this is a series about discipleship. You know, we, we talk a little bit about conversion, and a lot of our Christianity is emphasized about conversion. We put the emphasis on conversion here in North America, and what we're, we're going into here in this series is not talking just about conversion. We're talking about the decisions that come after conversion. Because conversion is the decision, but discipleship is all the little decisions that come after the big decision. Right? Like we saw in the video of the people making decisions to follow Jesus in very difficult, uncertain times. Right? Conversion Christianity would just tap out because it's hard. But discipleship digs in because it doesn't say what's best for me. It says, Jesus, what do you want me to do with what you've entrusted to me? And I hope you have that vein throughout the rest of this, this, uh, this message today. And also, as you consider uh, what God is doing and what God is doing through Crossroads in the Ukraine. So we've been talking about resources. We've been talking about time. We've been talking about money, and today we are talking about energy. Energy. And it's going to be awesome because I like it, and um, you know, it's really about honestly evaluating what we are doing with our resources. What we are working with and, and how we are working with God to maximize a return through us. And here's the thing. It's important that we understand we're making choices. That, that's the thing that stood out in that video to me is that the young lady who left the Ukraine but then made a choice three days later to return. And in American culture, this is hard for us, but I want to open it up to some possibilities here. See, we are not victims, right? We are not victims. We are not victims. We are making choices. See, if you are a victim, then you are helpless, now, granted, that makes it easier on you because you don't have to take any responsibility or accountability. You can just be a victim and be helpless and things happen to you. But I want you to see the positive side of the statement. If you're making choices, I hope you can see that it opens you up to a world of possibilities. That if you're making choices, things can get better simply by you making better choices. And my hope is that today, today is the time where you encounter Jesus and you decide to start making more kingdom of God choices and less kingdom of me choices. See, because this is the thing, and, and I hope you know, I want something for you, not from you. I want something to enrich your walk with God. 
I want you to go beyond what God provides. And I want you to invest in what will give you the greatest return. Here's the big idea. If you remember nothing else, remember this. Our energy is an investment. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you love us. I thank you that you are here, that you're present with us. That, God, your grace is all we need. Your love is all we need. Your provision is all we need. Father, help us to be faithful with it. And, Lord, bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's what Jesus said. He said this. He said, but don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. Jesus, freshly sealed by the Father. After feeding 5,000 people, Jesus walks away, and a lot of those people follow Jesus. And Jesus walks, and I love how Jesus just walks, and he just turns around and he says, and now. It's like he's leading you with bread, and then he wants to talk to you about real bread. So he tells these people, he's like, look, your bellies are full, and you're following me. And he stops, and he asks them pointedly, and he says, do you really see what this miracle means? Because you're following me because you have full bellies. But do you see beyond the miracle to what the miracle really means? In other words, is my involvement in your life bringing you closer to me? Now, we've got to bridge a gap here because we have to ask ourselves the same question. Does all that Jesus has done for you bring you closer to him? You see, what is your decision? Right? Do you, do you need a constant, uh, 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 uh? Let me just ask you this question. Has Jesus done enough for you right now to follow him the rest of your life? Okay, let's go home. Because, right. I mean, honestly, the point of this message is this. God wants more for you than you want for you. He wants to do more through you than you have any idea of what he wants to do through you. When you see what he does, does it reveal him to you? Does it reveal him more clearly? When you give, when you give, when you give, do you see his provision and Jesus exercising his provision is not just showing you he has money. He's demonstrating his lordship of the world. Because he can take what you give to the Ukraine and replace it with ten times more if he wants. But not just so you can spend it on yourselves. James made that very clear. If Jesus is the king of the world, then he is the king of me. See, the last two years, the church has been rocked. It's been difficult in the church world. And we in America, we don't like our Christianity difficult. We like our Christianity blessed. You know, oftentimes we come to church to get free of our problems. Not to be told there's more problems in the world that God wants us to do something about. Why is there hunger in the world? Because we spend all our money on ourselves. What is it? 80% of the world's money? Like 10% of the world's population? Why are people starving? Because we eat too much. You see, we signed up for miracles. We signed up for a constant stream of full bellies, and we've forgotten that there is something far more profound than what God provides. God himself. All the stuff God provides should lead us right to the feet of Jesus, and where we can sing, all the earth will shout your name. And Jesus says the same thing to them, and he says the same thing to us. It's not about bread. It's not about resources. We, people get angsty. You know, you talk about, we, saw, we set it off. You know, time was challenging, but you know, we're busy. 
And Amber talked about money. That, you know, people react differently in the church world about money. And now we're talking about energy. But we want you to see that he is revealing himself through these resources. It's not about these resources. He can maximize your resources if you entrust them to him. And he is addressing a huge tension that results from not seeing Jesus clearly. Worry. Worry comes from not seeing Jesus clearly. Fear comes from not seeing Jesus clearly. Control comes from not seeing Jesus clearly. Overwork comes from not seeing Jesus clearly. We worry we won't have enough, so we never rest. We worry we won't have enough, so we never give. And we miss the point that Jesus gives us all that we have, and the reason we don't have enough is because we don't rest and we don't give. You see, this is, this is the Jesus way. And again, discipleship is not about just securing fire insurance. It is about making small decisions every day to advance the kingdom. And as we advance the kingdom, we experience the presence of the living God. See, is Jesus still the king of the world? Is he the king of you? You see, your feelings are good, right? When we, when we understand this, feelings are good. They help us interpret our environment. But we have the ability to then apply cognitive logic to our feelings to help us understand what we should do. And in light of what we have discern, unfelt and in light of what we have decided, what are we going to do? And here's what Jesus is telling you, point blank. Invest your energy into the kingdom. That's the point-blank statement of Jesus. And though, to those of whom Jesus is king, we must take that statement seriously. Now, if Jesus is not your king, he ain't talking to you right now. Hopefully he will be. But if you call yourself a Christian, and by a Christian meaning not do you identify as a Christian, but does Jesus identify with you? Big difference biblically. Where is your investment going? It's the ROI. Everybody knows about ROI, right? You invest wisely, you buy, buy low, sell high. That's all good stuff, right? And investing, you know, if you had, we had the long little rope, you know, we would pull out the 100-foot rope, and I'd say, this is your life. This is eternity. Most of us, 90% of us, are investing for solely this little piece right here. When Jesus says invest for here, you get a better return. And the greatest return of our investment is something we often miss. We follow the bread and miss the bread of life. We expend all our energy building our personal kingdoms, and then we say, I do not have time to build the kingdom of God. Jeff, you just don't understand. Bro. <laughs> Sis. Don't want to leave anybody out. <laughs> I just want to tell you, man, I've, told, I've said no the last six weeks more than I've said no in the last 53 years. Pastor Joel said I was preaching today. It's an opportunity to build the kingdom of God. What am I going to say yes to? What about you? See, I had to say no to some good things to say yes to the greater investment. Hi, Gracie. I just call you there. <laughs> See, this is the thing. We work and we strive and we drag, drive ourselves ragged just to survive, and Jesus wants us to thrive. And the difference between driving ourselves crazy and thriving in him is connection to him and direction from him. So let me ask you, in light of resources, which is your life, do you, do, do you live that life in connection to Jesus, and do you live that life in direction from Jesus? 
do you have connection and direction in regards to your resources? Because kingdom life, you need to understand this, in kingdom life, our resources are what? Under authority. Not ours. It's his. John Wimber would say it like this. I'm a nickel in God's pocket and he can spend me any, any way he wants. That's not the attitude of a super Christian. That's the attitude of a Christian. All of us can have that attitude. You see, our resources are under authority. Our time is scheduled. Sabbath comes every week. And the object of our energy, understand this, the object of our energy is the object of our worship. What are you giving your energy to? That's what you worship. Who's your God? A friend of mine, somebody I love dearly, came up to me one day at work the post office and sat down next to me. He wasn't a Christian. In fact, very far from it. He said, the only way I'm ever going to church is if you're doing my funeral. And I said, well, you know, that may happen. Well, because it happens to all of us. That's just, a, that's just the facts, right? But he came up and sat down next to me in front of me. He wanted to make me uncomfortable. And he sat down and he goes, so man, am I going to hell? Real loud. And I said, I think you're going to spend eternity with whatever God you served on earth. And he said, I think I might be in trouble. And I said, I think you might too. The object of your energy is the object of your worship. See, here's, a, here's the thing about worship. Worship is given first. You know that, right? Worship comes first. See, leftovers come last. Right? Who's ever, whoever, who does holidays right? Who does Thanksgiving dinner right? Christmas dinner right? The rights, yes, we do. I just say this, if you've been to our house for Christmas or Thanksgiving, you have indeed been blessed. But I can promise you this, we give you the best in the house, not the last in the house. What are you giving to Jesus? Do you give him the best or the last? This is just, I mean, just questions for you, not a sermon, just a thought. You guys just think about that. But worship is first. Worship is given generously, not begrudgingly. You know, tithing is the, it's the floor, not the ceiling, right? It's where you start. It's just like, hey, this is just demonstrating faithfulness. Worship says, blah, take it all. Worship is sacrificial and costly. King David said, I will not take anything that does not cost me something. Does your worship cost you something or are you just too tired for it? Worship is fighting through what's tired, Worship is waking up when you're tired and saying, let us go to the house of the Lord. But I'm tired, so what? <laughs> hey, how about this? How about you come to church and call in sick for work? Wow. Sleep in there. But I'll get fired. See, we, but this gets to the really heart of the problem is, is that we take it seriously when it involves money. But if it doesn't involve money, we don't take it seriously. Right? And it's just, you know, I love you, so, you know. Worship is ongoing. Worship is first. Worship is generous. Worship is sacrificial and costly. And worship is ongoing. You cannot outgive God. You cannot not outserve God. We have mental, we have emotional, we have physical energy. Now, there's three ways to increase our energy, and these are pretty, pretty, um, I think, powerful. If you lean into them, I think it'll make a difference. There's discernment, there's rest, and there's care. One, there's discernment, right? You have to understand what God wants you to do with your resources. That is your responsibility. Not Pastor Joel, not Pastor Christina, Pastor Steve, Pastor Amber. It's not their job to tell you what to do with your resources. It's your job to discern what God wants you to do, which means you have to have conversation with him and say, Jesus. You want to try that? Say, Jesus. Jesus. Say it just like that. It's more powerful and spiritual. What do you want me to do with my money? <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. Come on, it's just not hard. What do you want me to do with my time? Jesus, what do you want me to do with my energy? See, he's faithful, and he will tell you if you ask him. 
Problem is, we don't say, Jesus, what do you want me to do? We say, Jesus, bless what I have done. Rest. Jesus was intentional about the 12 getting rest. In Matthew's account of feeding of the 5,000, he fed the 5,000, and then he told them to go, or actually, he, they went to the place where they were going to feed the 5,000. Jesus said, you guys are tired because you just got done casting out demons and healing the sick. Go rest. And then one of my favorite clauses in Scripture, it says the crowd came and Jesus began ministering to him. And then it said this, later in the afternoon, the apostles joined him. Why? Because they rested. Why? Because Jesus told them to rest. Some of you need to rest with intentionality. Some of us need to hear Jesus tell us to order our lives a little better so we can get involved in kingdom work more seriously. Rest so we can do what he has told us to do, not what everybody else has told us to do. This is the freedom of the kingdom. We are free from our king to do what he wants over what anybody else wants. Put what he wants over what everyone else wants. And Jesus wants us to rest for kingdom work, not rest at the expense of kingdom work because our lives are filled with building a different kingdom. See, this is the thing. We often live our lives not asking the owner what we should do. We act like serving a couple hours a week in church is the thing that's exhausting us. Let me just ask you this. When your life gets pressed, why is church the first thing you cut out? Why is your first call to the children's pastor saying, I can't serve this Sunday, I'm tired? Now, hopefully that didn't happen this week, right? We didn't have that because then it totally looks like I'm just using insider information. No, as a pastor for a lot of years, this is just what happens. <laughs> call-ins, call-ins, call-ins for a situation that you wouldn't call in to work for is the life cycle of a church. And here's what you're doing. You're not just saying, I can't do children's ministry at Kids Crossing because I'm tired. You're saying, I don't really want to invest in the next generation because I'm tired. You see, you phrase it like that, and it becomes more real. Because that's really what you're doing. I'm not going to use churchianity to get you out of trouble. You just need to think about stuff. No amens to that one. Come on. It's all fun. <laughs> Amen, that one. Care. Care for yourself. You have to schedule self-care. Self-care needs to be a time that you schedule for you to flourish that should be untouchable. Spouses, help your spouse schedule self-care. That's why there's two of you, so that you can watch each other's back and do this. I'm talking about mental care, physical care, and emotional care. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the one thing you have to have in order to do those things is margin. Andy Stanley said margin is this, the space between our current pace and our limits. It's also been said the, the space between our load and our limits. Our, poten our maximum potential is a far uh, in compared to what we do. See, margin is the opposite of overload. Most of us live overloaded lives. Margin is intentional underload. It's scheduling less than you have available. You have to fight for margin. You do. Learn to evaluate ruthlessly and say, am I going to give my energy to this? Okay. This requires purposely and strategically eliminating the non-essentials in your life. You have to say no to something you might want to do. So anyway, what do we do with all this? Make this very practical for you. Because um, you know, I hope when we talk about practicality, it doesn't make you feel like it's not a spiritual thing. This is a spiritual thing. Jesus is all up in this. When Jesus told them to go rest, he wasn't just saying schedule your time better, take care of your physical needs. He was saying, we have important kingdom work involved that I want you to be involved in. But in order to perform at your maximum potential, you need to rest. You need to take care of yourself. Next steps. One, ask the owner what you should be giving your energy to. That's the best advice you could ever have for any type of resource. Ask the owner, should I be doing this? Number two, schedule your life. 
Margin comes from a schedule. Scheduling less than you have available. I would encourage you all to move to a fixed calendar or at least schedule the things that are important. Choose intentionality over reaction. How do you build a schedule? You've got to determine what's most important. Jesus said loving God and loving people is what's most important. After we pencil that one in, then we get to start penciling other things in. Remember, kingdom looks like God is in charge. Then schedule it. Schedule everything else around what's important and leave margin between the items on your schedule. If you start to do that, you're going to start to see yourself have more energy. If you apply that to money, you're going to start to see yourself have more money. You're going to realize, wait a minute, God did give me enough. I just stopped spending it all. And then whatever doesn't get scheduled just doesn't get done. Now, the things that that I've been told when I've taught this before is like, I can't do that. That would drive me crazy. Look, there is absolutely no statistic evidence, statistical evidence that says being organized drives you crazy. (laughs) Now, some of you need to hear that. No, some, some of us need to hear that being on time is not going to kill you. It will bless you. Let me ask you a real question, though. Can you continue at the pace you're going? How long? When you blow up, who besides you pays the price? This is the part where you look at everybody you love. It's not okay for you to blow up because you failed to schedule self-care. If you do blow up because you failed to schedule self-care, you guys need to have a conversation. And say, we need to make sure we're getting, each getting the care that we need. See, if you're not a, question, uh, not a Christian, Jesus taps into the biggest need we face in our culture. See, in Jesus, whether you believe in him or not, he is the most influential man who ever lived. He said the pursuit of him is the best investment you can make with your time, your energy, and your money. Bro, you go over, we're cutting you off, huh? (laughs) Look, look, look. Much of our stress in life comes from the fact that we spend all of our energy on kingdom building, not God's kingdom, but our kingdom. And Jesus said he will give you the greatest return on your investment with what he has entrusted to you. Now, maybe you're a Christian. Maybe you have little involvement in the church. Maybe all of your time and your energy and your money go to the kingdom of me, and you're like, I don't have anything left for the church. You feel too busy. You feel too tired. Can I just ask you this? Pastors, close their ears. Did you talk to Jesus about that? I'm going to assure you, he did not tell you that was a good thing. Let me talk to parents. You're teaching and training your kids how to view church. Statistically, again, seven, this, this is why it's so important that there is never a need for volunteers or partners back in cross, uh, kids crossing. <sighs> when you're moving, English is a hard language. It really is. <laughs> There should never be a need for that because statistically, 75% of young adults will not go to church when they're no longer required to. In other words, when you stop making them, they'll stop going. And as a former youth pastor, this is what I've seen. Look, some church experiences were awful and they should not go back to that church. I understand, that, that is legit. The second reason is sin is fun. One day they're gonna realize that it's fun to sin. It's destructive, but it's fun. And they're going to realize that. And then one day they'll turn around and they'll come back. Sometimes they're going to see that their Sunday school, Jesus can't handle their grown-up world. And that's true. But most of the time, you know what I've seen? Their parents have taught them that church is not important. 
by being late, by skipping church, by complaining about church, by doing things other than church during church, building into them that church is something you do when you have the time. I can promise you this, when your child hits 17, 18, and you can't drag them anymore, they will stop coming to church. If you, if you, you know, Jesus said if you train a child up, or Proverbs, train a child up in the way he should go, and he's old, he won't depart from it. That works for idolatry too. Maybe church is like a corporation and less like a family to you. I want to kind of encourage you with this. The focus of your resources determines the quality of your relationships. You see, if if you're feeling distant, if you're feeling like, hey, I don't feel really connected here at Crossroads, are your resources going here? Because I can promise you this, if you get involved and you serve here, you will fall in love here. Like, just I, I, we came back here, what four months ago? How many of us? How many we didn't know each other four months ago? I like you all. You guys are awesome. You know, I do two services so I can see everybody. I'd like to suggest there's another level. There's a better way in regards to your resources. Go beyond conversion into discipleship. Here's the thing. Our lives are a stewardship. They are temporary. And we are accountable for them. Make an investment here. Start to serve in the local church here. If you're online and you're far away, serve in your local church. You are called to be a spiritual contributor, not a spiritual consumer. We are called to belong to Jesus and to use what he has entrusted to us for his glory and building his kingdom. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, since you have been raised to new life, you know, since Jesus did all the work by saving you, Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think of the things of heaven, not the things of earth, for you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Let's remember this, guys. Our energy is our investment. Where are you investing yourself? Let's pray.